I just got a bulletin. All right, so attrition. What what city was besieged? Yeah, Petersburg. And what was the battle? The name of the battle where they tried to blow a mine up? So we we got to hear right. Did I talk about damn the torpedoes full speed ahead? Yeah. All right, good, great saying. And let me think. Oh, so we said so we got through attrition. We got through that. Who saved the Union? Jefferson. I thought it was Raoul C. Calhoun. No. no. Yes, you can dress up as Raoul C. Calhoun. So we have four people. I'm, I'm too nice on dress up day. Aren't I? Aren't I? All right, so dress up day will be next Thursday. So I'll give you one more day to remember about the test. And oh, almost forgot. I don't know if you know this, but you know, I'm, I told you I'm going to show that documentary on Festivus on the last Friday before that online channel. So you're more than welcome to come in. It's a, it, it is it is really informative. But something I forgot to mention yesterday. Did you know that the guy who made the documentary, in fact, a whole series of these, did you know that? He was in town last night. I worked at Concession. Oh, you worked at What? Hey, the guy who made the documentary was in town. He did a he did a, a speech, kind of a. <laughs> who was it? Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah. And what's his documentary series called? Seinfeld. Seinfeld. So I will show. So you're yeah, I, I went to it. I'm a big sign though. I like his I like his work. So has it, you know, you've seen it, right? Has anyone else seen the uh, documentary? Yeah, you yeah, you saw you saw, yeah. Really informative, isn't it? It's great. It is great. All right, I showed you that picture. I love that cartoon of Lincoln. And so a couple of things really quick that happened afterwards. Remember Hood? What Hood did, are we recording? Am I live? <laughs> We're live. Coast to coast, people. <laughs> yeah, hi, Mom. <laughs> it's Freud. Okay. I'll scare somebody. Should we decapitate Marie Antoinette for the people? <laughs> That'd be awful, Bruce. All right. What Hood did was, here's Sherman, and he was desperate. So what he thought he could do is cut off the supply line. And he, General Hood, invaded into Tennessee. He only had about 30,000 men left. And there'd be a couple sharp fights, but then eventually his army of the West, the last Confederate army of the West, would try to take Nashville. And the Battle of Nashville, one of the most decisive of the, of the war, the 15th and 16th, he tried to take Nashville, couldn't, and then Union soldiers under General Thomas, that Thomas was the same guy who was called the Rock of Chickamauga, Thomas attacked the Confederates and destroyed them. The Confederate Army of the West that had been fighting from Shiloh and Vicksburg, all these battles, gone. It was effectively destroyed. There's still a Confederate force across the Mississippi, but it's obviously very small in Texas and Arkansas. And that's it. A few of the stragglers started making their way east, but it's over in the west. The war is running, or the war is ending very quickly. While we're there, going back to this, Sherman is right here. And Sherman sends word of a strategy he has. And the strategy is to take the war to the civilians, and we call it today total war. Total war is a term that comes from World War I. That's Sherman on his horse overlooking some of the Confederate defenses of Atlanta after they fell. And Sherman came up with this idea, and to give you the basic definition is this. Total war means taking the war to the civilians taking the war to what we would call in the 20th century, and today, the home front. So may civilians suffer, combined with something else, destroy their means to fight. 
destroy factories, destroy railroads, destroy them. Take the war to civilians. Basically what it is is this. They couldn't win a big battle on the battlefield to win the war. So now we are going to make civilians suffer so much. Lack of supplies. Destroyed homes. Maybe even civilians dead. That they eventually make the government quit fighting. Take the war to their homes. Everybody becomes a combatant. Every man, woman, and child in the South is now the enemy. Make them suffer so much that they quit. So you got that. It's a two-part thing. It's not just attacking the home front and attacking civilians. Because they're not psychopaths. There's a horrific logic. We make war so horrible. We make people suffer so much, we quit. It's very much like attrition on a grand scale. We make them all suffer. And that's how wars are fought today. Civilians are direct targets. Now, in war, hey, you want to destroy a factory? Factories are hard to hit. What's the best way to destroy a factory? Kill the workers. Civilians are targets. Now, in 1864, they couldn't do it. But you know, they couldn't actually go attack places except for where the army marched. But that's what Sherman suggested. Let me take most of my army and I'll cut a swath of destruction from Georgia. Destroy anything that can be used for the war effort. Anything. And make it very clear to the rest of the South. If you continue to, if you continue to resist, Sherman's coming. Sherman is coming. And this is going to be known as, you remember? His example of total war, what did they call it? <laughs> Where's my da, da, da. march to the sea? Exactly right. I'll talk about bummers in just a second, but the march to the sea. In fact, after the war, there's a very popular song in the North called <laughs> Marching Through Georgia, and it talks about destroying Georgia. And it's actually really funny because Georgia Tech, the college, it's not their school, it's not their, their school song, but they play this song. Marching through Georgia whenever Georgia Tech does well in football or basketball. And I think that's really funny because the song's about destroying Georgia. If you uh, ever heard University of Montana school songs, it's the music to Georgia Tech school song. Small world. They ran out of school songs, I guess. But does everyone get that though? Take the war. And this, I gotta be something, make something very clear about total war. It's arguably, in fact, I think it is, the most horrible thing ever invented by mankind. There's a lot of bad things. Total war is the worst. Because once you make the leap to saying we can do anything we want to enemy civilians, and it might be with us, anything we want to end the war, you justify it to end the war, that justifies anything, anything to end the war. And I am not kidding. Anything. You can say, we, we have to do it, we have to win the war. World War I, it'll start at a scale that's unprecedented. World War II, slaughter like we can't even imagine. The Holocaust, you know what that is. Most of the happening areas that Germany conquered, not Germany itself, it's complex. That was a measure of total war. And when wars are near the end, like right here, the South is done. After Lincoln is elected, there is no way the Confederacy can win. But when wars are near over, they get more bloody. They get more horrible. Because the side who's winning just wants to end the thing. And they're trying anything they can. So in World War II, for example, the United States and Britain started bombing every single civilian target across Germany, beginning in about February to the end of the war. Anything moving, they tried to bomb. And they weren't very accurate, so they killed a lot of people outside the targets. Anything. Any civilians. If there were American or British planes flying over, they would machine gun them. Anything to try to get them to quit. Japan, every Japanese city was destroyed by firebombs. They were trying to surrender. They're done. And yet we still drop two atomic bombs. That's total war. And it gets worse. We'll talk obviously more about it, but I can't think of anything more horrible. I can't think of anything. So, 
back to this. Sherman grants a good idea. So what Sherman did is they eventually started marching out from Atlanta. Now they're going to burn down warehouse houses in town that had Union supplies that couldn't carry along. Sherman's army was going to live off the land. Part of the process of destroying it is stealing everything along the way. Well, when they started burning down these warehouses in Atlanta, the fire spread and burned down Atlanta. Now, they weren't trying to burn down, the, down Atlanta, but let's be clear about it. You burn down a big warehouse full of, full of wheat or clothing, anything like that you want to destroy, and it's in the middle of town, you think the fire is just going to stop at the warehouse? Burn us, oh, that's a civilian house. No, nope, we're not going to burn it anymore. No, when they burned it down, they knew the good chance was the whole town was going to burn down. Burn down. So they could claim we didn't need to, but yeah, let's be honest. It was a fringe benefit. And it goes with today. Now they give the term collateral damage. But if a country, which is what the United States does now, if they're bombing somebody trying to get a target and they know they're in an area where civilians are nearby and probably going to get killed and still do it, you're killing the civilians on purpose. There's no way around it. Total war is horrific. So, bombers were people who followed the march, stragglers, and they looted even more. Normally, Sherman would have not, not allowed these stragglers to bomb with soldiers or just crooks who follow the line of march, but he let it go because that spread the terror. So here are bombers on a Harper's engraving, attacking a plantation home, looting it, and then you can see them starting to burn stuff. As Sherman marched through, they burnt down every building in every town that could be used for the war effort. What could be used for the war effort? Yeah, everything. Yeah. So they would burn down whole towns. Or the same deal, you burned down part of it, but the fire was spread. All that would remain would be the chimneys. So they started calling those Sherman's tombstones. And then they cut up the railways. The problem with the railways were the rails, you rip the rails off, you could use them again. So they built Sherman's neckties. And what they would do is take the rails off, put them over the ties, light the ties on fire, so what can you do? Start getting hot and bend them, like a necktie. So you can't use them again. They got really good at it. And also, Sherman found out something that I guess he probably already knew. It's fun to break stuff. People like to destroy things. It's a bad thing that people have. Let's go break stuff. For example, if I just suggested one day, let's go into Let's go into Mr. Foucault's room and break everything. What would you guys say? Yeah, let's do it! Right? I'm looking around. Would anybody stop us? Not a one of you would stop us. Who would stop us? Name one person. We'd... You'd all like, let's go break stuff. If I said, hey, let's go to Hell on High and just destroy it, what would you say? <laughs> yeah. Would anybody stop me? And somebody would try to stop me, I know you'd be the first one. Yeah! We shouldn't do that. Talk to the camera now. Don't do that. <laughs> Wink. I don't do that. I'm winking under my hand. All right, so. Can anyone do that when I see I can't do the wink. I can't even wink, but that's pretty I obvious. I have to open my mouth when I wink. <laughs> me too. Yeah, I'm just like, <laughs> Otherwise, it's All right, so I know what else you're thinking. Wait a minute. What does Chester the Crab think about this? Well, here's from the Chester the Crab, History of the United States. I showed you one for the Whiskey Rebellion, I think, a little bit earlier. And here's his version of it. They're just having fun getting pigs, burning stuff. And here's Chester the Crab telling the story. On December 22nd, the march ended. They lived about a month and a half. They're out of communication. And they arrived on December 22nd at Savannah. Savannah, the few Confederate forces there surrendered or just ran away. Sherman took the town and sent a message up to President Lincoln. I present you for Christmas, the city of Savannah. And that's why you have this on the bottom here. There's the craft telling the story. Santa clearly was a union man. In fact, 
That Santa that we think of was literally just being drawn at that time by, by Thomas Nast. The, the, the view of Santa Claus would have been, the few people, few people knew what it was, but most would have said he was a skinny guy. But, you know, times got good, he ate a lot more. And Savannah fell, if you go there today, the people in Georgia have not forgotten. So don't go there with your William Becomes a Sherman t-shirt. I know a lot of you are thinking about wearing that and walk around there, yay, Sherman. No, don't do it, do not. Every public building that was rebuilt after the war that were destroyed because of Sherman's march, like every courthouse and all these little towns along the way, the front doors all very defiantly face south. We'll show you. I know I don't know how that shows you, but they did. And my brother, was a professor at Georgia Southern, which is in Statesville, Georgia, right about to be right here on the march, right where that guy is. And they destroyed much of the town. And so when he got there, they knew he was a Yankee. And so they made it very clear, don't let people know you're a Yankee. We haven't forgotten Sherman. That's what he was told by the head of the economics department at Georgia Southern. I always found that fascinating. He didn't like it. He didn't the stage room. Weird place. He's in Ohio now. Cool, huh? He's been to Ohio. You have? I'm going there for Christmas. I'm sorry, that's it. So, I know you're supposed to like saying, say it. Wow. <laughs> All right, so, that's Christmas. The last of the war, and the reason I put this up here, this is Harper's Magazine. And you notice the toys. Remember I told you that Christmas, the, the celebration that would come, and the importance of Christmas would be an industrial revolution thing? And only about 20 years, and all of a sudden they are with their gifts, and they're already making new, a new batch of soldiers for the next war. And yeah, that'd be pretty common. Why do you think the Boy Scouts were created? Soldiers. That's why. In Britain, but it's spread right here for that reason. No, he's not impaled. They normally did not impale children then. That came later. That became a Christmas tradition eventually. The impaling of the child. So, now some people are like, I wonder if anybody's going, cool. <laughs> so, then Sherman did this. Sherman took his army and marched into South Carolina. He's actually going up into Virginia. He's going to cut a path all the way through. And when they go through South Carolina, if people thought Georgia was destroyed, South Carolina was devastated. He went right through the center. The few Confederate forces, once get under that same General Johnson who was put back in command, they were on Charleston. He just went right through the middle, leveling it. Why did Sherman take such special attention on South Carolina? Exactly. And then actually when they got to North Carolina, he ordered them, to, ordered them to quit. Yeah, they still would devastate some areas, but nothing like before. Well, it's over. It is over for the Confederacy. One more example of total war map to show you, though. In the Shenandoah Valley, Grant ordered General Sheridan. Remember Sheridan was the guy who charged a missionary and raised and jumped on the cannon? He ordered Sheridan to destroy the Shenandoah Valley, and he devastated it. In fact, the saying was, there wasn't one stock of corn or one crow flying after Sheridan got through. Same deal, total war. So the Shenandoah Valley and the march to the sea are going to symbolize total war and how the war is changing, getting more horrific. In fact, this is where Sherman would respond that we must make the South know that war is all hell. Now, later on, people would say things said war is hell. They didn't quite say that, but essentially. And we're not going to talk much about this. He would rally forces at a battle called Winchester. That's Sheridan. And that's the horse that's perpetually in that position at the Smithsonian Museum of Hitting American History. And let's get to one more thing very quickly. Arlington National Cemetery was created. The Adjutant General of the United States Army, the guy responsible for not only potentially supplies, but also how to deal with hospitals for, for those who died. Well, the cemeteries were full. 
After what happened from the wilderness all the way through Petersburg and the battles in the Shenandoah Valley, just in Virginia, they're full. Well, the, the adjutant general's son, General Mays was his name, but Mays' son died at Petersburg. He blamed one man. That's what Mays did is he confiscated that man's plantation just across the Potomac River. He took it and turned it into Arlington National Cemetery, the most hollow ground in America. Who's farm? The farmhouse is still there today. Whose plantation was it? Well, no. Robert E. Lee's. That's Wait, Robert. The U.S. Army. His, his name was General Meigs, but all we need to know is the Army just took it. They confiscated it. Yeah, Lee, after the war, he lived for another four years after the war. He never went back to his plantation. If you go there, you tour the plantation home. There's slave quarters behind it. That's all you need to know. But it's, a, it's an amazing place. The most hollow ground in the United States. Here are some of the first markers in Arlington. And later on, the more solid white granite, a slightly different change, or um, slightly different style of granite tombstones. And anybody who's a veteran or a certain connection with the military can be buried there. It's, I think it's within one or two years of 84. I can't remember the exact number, but it's just awful. You know, it's a big area, but it's been a long time. And for example, John F. Kennedy's grave is just over here. I just can't see it, but it's just out of sight here. After World, World War I, the United States copied the French. The French, but did a tomb of the unknown soldier. So that's there a little bit off in that direction behind that picture. Has anyone been there? If you get a chance, though, it's really remarkable. The change in the guard, the guard of the tomb. There's a, a regiment that does all the ceremonies for the funerals, those who are buried. They're called Third Regiment of the Old Guard. They have these very highly trained men that do this ceremony. I was lucky, just pure, pure luck, and the entire regiment came out and did it when I was there. So about 700 men. Pretty amazing. Just pure luck. You know, just, we just happened to be there. And I also was there, I saw a funeral. Just on one of the funerals of the old guard, putting it on. Pretty amazing. If you get a chance, go. And if you get to that where Lee's house is, you look right down the wall. So you can see the Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Monument, and the Capitol. It's pretty incredible. Go. I'm not kidding. One more thing. When I was there, I think this was the second time. And I'm walking around, and I'm standing by there's, there's, you know, there's gravestones all over, and I'm looking at them, you know, catching names I knew. It's pretty, you know, it's just amazing. And I just happen to look down at the tombstone, the back of it, some of the time on the back, they put the name, and the back of it, right in front of me, Partridge. <laughs> That's a little weary. <laughs> It was someone who died in this, or it was a veteran of the Spanish American War, but it's right there, just cartridge. So, oh, almost forgot. One tomb there from all the unknown soldiers, all those who died they couldn't identify from Wilderness, Pennsylvania, Petersburg, Cold Harbor, over 15,000 bodies in one tomb there. They couldn't identify them. They buried them all together in this massive monument there. So, with that, the Confederates are near a collapse. And they finally, the Confederate lines at Petersburg finally collapsed on the night of the 2nd and 3rd of April of 1865. Davis was getting more and more desperate. He put Lee in overall command, but it was too late. He even offered to emancipate the slaves, hoping that Britain would enter the war. That should give you an idea of two things. First off, how desperate they were, but secondly, doesn't that defeat the entire purpose you were fighting? That showed you how desperate. It was done. And now it's just a matter of time of when. What happened was, Meade's army finally cut off that last rail leg, and they couldn't hold out. And so literally that night, they had to do a panicky retreat out of Petersburg. And when Petersburg retreat, when Petersburg, uh, was, that line was given up, Richmond fell too. Those are Confederate prisoners at Appomattox Courthouse, which we'll in a second. That is taken on the 3rd of April. And that's a Confederate soldier who died in the last fighting that night. And look how young he is, skinny. I mean, they were literally out of food. Hundreds of men were deserting every night from Lee's army because they just simply were starving to death. 
The rations were down to virtually no protein. Corn cobs ground up to make bread mixed in with sawdust. Fill me up. I don't want to tell you what it did to your intestines. You can imagine. I know it's everything. Sawdust, good. No, it's not. And it didn't cook all the way. It would be rotten. It was just horrific what they were down to. And at the same time then, Richmond, they had to evacuate. And in the panicky retreat from Richmond, trying to burn records and various storages, the Confederates burnt Richmond down themselves by mistake. You know, once you start burning stuff in the middle of town, you can't really stop it. Lincoln could not wait. With a small cavalry escort the day after Richmond fell, he, he was one of the first American, uh, first ones from the north to Richmond. He was so excited. Just, just uh, it's almost over. And so this is a picture afterwards, and he did not quite look like that when he entered it. There's a little more disheveled. But when Lincoln entered it, the day after it fell, thousands of freedmen, what they call former slaves, weeping and singing met Lincoln. He, he would say afterwards that was one of the greatest moments of his life. This is the fifth. Less than, less than 10 days left. Lee kept retreating then, and here's Petersburg and Richmond. He's going to go to the, the, the Appalachian Mountains. Lee cannot quit. He's thinking about doing the guerrilla war. He doesn't even know what to do. And as they march, the Confederate soldiers are so weak from malnutrition that thousands are just staggering behind and they, they're left behind. So his army is literally bleeding away. So there'll be a sharp fire here at Sailor's Creek. You don't need to write that down. And then finally, Union Cavalry, under George Armstrong Custer, the youngest major general in the army, cut off Lee's retreat at Appomattox Courthouse. And Lee realized it's done. It's over. Appomattox Courthouse. And here's Wilmer McLean's house, where Lee would surrender to Grant. Wilmer McLean, if you remember that video of the cause, it was his home at Manassas, where the Civil War started. Realizing this might be dangerous, he moved to a quiet place, Appomattox Courthouse. So the war began in this front yard and ended in this front parlor. Interesting little quirk. Lee sent word that he surrendered. Meade couldn't quite make it there. In fact, Lee and Grant, or Meade and Grant were like, oh, God, we're not going to catch him. Okay, oh, everything changed. It's over. And Meade couldn't make the, excuse me, the ceremony. Grant did. This is a famous engraving afterwards. And it makes a big mistake. Meade wasn't there. He couldn't make it. He's really mad. There's Sheridan. There's Custer. A few other generals. Grant got there. Humiliated, trying to be dignified. Grant, or when I say Grant, Lee was trying to be dignified. Grant just showed up like he always did, you know, kind of disheveled, kind of covered with mud, because he rode as fast as he could to be there. And Grant tried to make a little bit of small talk, said something to the effect of, I remember you from the old army. He, they were both at Chipotlepec. And Lee said something to the effect of, I don't remember you. And Grant was a little bit annoyed, but then again, Grant remembered, I won. And so, Lee surrendered all his men of, of the Army of Northern Virginia, and Grant gave very lenient terms. Basically, they just had to give up their weapons and they could go home. They're called parole. And the big thing was, he gave them food. He gave them food. And the Army of Northern Virginia is done. Grant, Grant turned out to be the general who could do it. In some ways, a very good channel. There is a pit painting of the next day's surrender ceremony. And the only reason I put this up there is because right here, the man who Lee, I'm sorry, that's Grant chose to accept the Confederate overall surrender, to accept the surrender of the army, was Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Remember the guy who held Little Round Talk with the 20th Maine? Do you remember that? This picture is right here. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. He was promoted. He was horrifically wounded, and they assumed he was going to die at one of the attacks of the Petersburg defenses. He'd be awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, and somehow he recovered from this wound. 
must have all been him for the rest of his life. And he's a major general now, he would accept this. He would later on, after the war, would become one of the most famous veterans in the North, one of the great heroes of the, uh, the United States. He'd be governor of Maine. He would be, a, he would be president and also teach at Bowdoin College. He'd teach every subject but math. Pretty amazing guy. He was just this giant figure. And he would die of his wounds in 1912. He would die of those wounds. Chamberlain. And so that's the surrender. Now, it's not quite over yet. But right after the surrender, they had a big celebration in Washington, Washington D.C. Fans came out and played all kinds of martial music. And Lincoln was there. And Lincoln requested Dixie. Now, by then, Dixie, which was written by a northerner, but that was a song that's a very southern song. And that was their song. And they said, no, are you kidding him? Dixie? And he said, you know, I think we conquered Dixie. It's back in the U.S., which I think is a great line. Well, one more thing then. Before this happened, but I'm putting it here, it's a month before, but still, Lincoln would get his second inaugural address. And he would finish it with this great line that's on top. And he focused on the country is going to have to have a time of healing and reconciliation. But the thing is, and Lincoln knew this, the South is not going to be reconciliation and we all come together and be back the way it was before. There's going to have to be some changing of Southern society and the economy called Reconstruction. It's going to have to happen. But I put a question mark there because we're not really sure what Lincoln was going to do. Lincoln taught reconciliation, but we know from his time as president, he was a ruthless man, and he would do whatever he felt was necessary. And so, yes, this was a great speech. Yes, it talked we have to bring the country together. But he also certainly knew it's not going to be as easy as shaking hands or fine. We must all come together for a group hug. Now, that's a good picture of Lincoln's inauguration. You can see him giving his speech right here. The reason I'm showing you right this right now is this. Oh, that's the last picture of Lincoln ever taken. Last photograph. The war is taking a toll, but it does seem a little more cheerful than some of the other pictures, but a very melancholy look. I think that's a good picture. I like that. Kind of looking off at an angle. Let's look at this picture again. The inauguration. You see it? See Lincoln? Where's that? I can't see him now. Right there. Okay, you look. You know some people? See him? Can you guess who that is? John Wilkes Booth. Booth, look how close he is. He was planning on, but decided not to do it, to kill President Lincoln at the second inaugural address. Look at that. It's pretty, it's kind of scary. You I think I have a share. And Wilkes was one of the most famous actors in America, a very well-known man, and there he was. A southerner from Virginia. Remember, it was his militia unit that witnessed John Brown's execution. And Lincoln would be assassinated just five days after the surrender, August 14th. That's John Wilkes Booth, this famous actor. He would be in charge of a conspiracy. Now, you're going to hear a lot of definitions of conspiracy. I know you've all heard the term conspiracy. But a conspiracy has a very easy definition. Very easy. Anyone know what it is? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, basically more than one. More than one person working together to commit a crime. That's all a conspiracy is. So it could be a crime against any number of things, but just more than one person. And it was a conspiracy. At first they talked about shooting the president at an inaugural address, then kidnapping him. Then the decision was to execute him and other leading members of the United States government, Booth and his associates. Booth was going to kill both Lincoln and President Grant. They were going to Ford's Theater and watch a play called My American Cousin. Very popular comedy, and I've seen it, and it was hilarious in 1865, I'm guessing. It doesn't quite match sense of humors today. It's kind of, okay. But back then, what the heck? They loved it. Grant did not want to go. He's tired. He just got back from the front. 
And so he had his wife claim she had a headache, so he didn't have to go. Arguably saving his life. Booth was well known, so we a well known actor, so we could just go right in, not slip past the guard who went to go um, get something to eat real fast and left the door unguarded or get something to drink. And so two derringers and a knife, Booth slipped in to, to where Lincoln was watching. And fortunately, he'd go up to this little balcony seat where it's watching, the, now it's all um, tied off. with still the back, there's an American flag there. That's still there. Has anyone been to Fort Theater? Tiny. It's a lot smaller than let's say our auditorium. Yeah, I get to hear about Fort Theater, and I don't know what I expect. If it's something a lot bigger, it's really kind of kind of weird how small it is. Very intimate theater. They still have place there. They still have place. And he jumped in, shot Lincoln with a derringer from about a small little pistol. From just a few feet away, not a lot of black powder, so the bullet wasn't going very fast. So it went in here and went in a couple, uh, maybe an inch and a half. He might have survived today, probably very good chance he could have. But when the surgeon who first got there didn't have his tools with him, the surgeon was watching the play and saw the hole. And what he's a battlefield surgeon, and what they do is they find, try to get the bullet out as quickly as possible. So he didn't have his equipment, he used the only thing he could figure out his pinky. And by sticking that in and then pulling it out, it opened up all the blood vessels. So there's no chance. I mean, it's not that he screwed up. I mean, that's he'd been around the woods before, you gotta do it, but that's what caused it. Someone watching who took Grant's place, a major rat farm, he tried to stop him. Booth slashed him with his knife and then jumped about 15 feet to the stage. It said sick temper tyrannus, that's not two tyrants, and then stumbled off. Booth shattered his ankle when he landed. Didn't realize it's what he mounted his horse, you know, the adrenaline was really going, but shattered it. And the biggest manhunt in American history after that time started. But that's not the only one. Lewis Powell, one of the conspirators, was going to kill Secretary of State Seward. He slashed Seward with his knife, sit in that corner, but did not kill him. Just nasty cuts, but nothing major. Okay. It's major if you got a bunch of cuts with a knife. I'm not saying that would nerf, but nothing didn't kill him. George Azeroth was going to kill the vice president. There he is over there. But he lost his nerve and just got drunk. So that's how the conspiracy ended. Some were caught. Some rode off. Azeroth and Powell. The real worry was this was a massive conspiracy involving the government of Davis, who's now fleeing south, still trying to escape. And I'll tell you, real fast, they went. They escaped, went to Surat Tavern. You don't need to know, I'm just telling you really quickly. And that's where they stayed, this tavern slash uh, boarding house. He got his leg fixed at Dr. Mudd's home and eventually would be run down about 12 days later. He'd be killed in a barn by U.S. cavalry men. This is the wanted poster for it. So all you need to know is, is Booth is going to be killed. But back to Lincoln. Lincoln was taken to Willard House, which is a, a house across the street. It's not part of it's not part of the historical park there, the kind of monument there, so you can go into it. It's, they try to leave it exactly the way it was when Lincoln died. He didn't fit in the bed. It doesn't show up there, but they had to kind of turn him sideways because he was so tall. And he never really regained consciousness. His wife, who had already um, had a nervous breakdown because when their son died in 1862, was never the same after this. And Secretary of War Stan kind of took over. But Lincoln died that morning. If you go there, they still have the bed, the same sheets, and they are black from the blood. It's still there. It's one of those things I know it's kind of, you know, it seems kind of awful, but actually it, it, it's a very fitting memorial. It's, it, you just have to go there. Because my first thought, the blood is just awful, but you went there, it just, you know what I mean? You just have to see it. Now we have, oh. Five conspirators would be executed. Here's four being executed at one time, including Mary Surratt right here. You see her dress. Her crime appears to be, she might have known about the conspiracy, but her big crime was she had the boarding house and they were looking for retribution. Retribution, and they executed her. They would all be hung. Andrew Johnson is now president. What party is Johnson? What party? He's a Democrat. He's a Democratic, member of the Democratic Party. He's a Southerner, 
And now, isn't that amazing? You have a Southern president right after the Confederacy. Yeah, he stayed with the Union, but a very weird quirk. And he was so nervous. He never dreamed he would actually be president. And he was so nervous, right before he was sworn in, one of his friends suggested, have a shot of whiskey. It will calm you down. He proceeded to have many shots of whiskey. And at his oath of office, he was very drunk. That's a bad omen for the Johnson administration, which would be considered one of the worst administrations in history. And he'd be the first president to be impeached. Wasn't convicted, but was impeached. Who's the other president who was impeached? Nixon resigned before he was impeached. He would have been. In your lifetime, just barely. Oh, yeah. yeah, Clinton. Bill Clinton's the only other one to be impeached. He wasn't convicted in the Senate, but he was impeached by the House. So, Johnson. Before we get to that, real fast, you don't need to write this down. I just I just put this up here to show you that the last Confederate Army in the East finally surrendered in North Carolina. Sherman and Johnson right there, they were friends with the old army. They'd become friends afterwards. In fact, in 1889, when Sherman passed away, Johnston was one of his pallbearers. It was an early March, miserable, rainy day, cold, you know, you can imagine. But Johnson, who was also old and frail, still wounded, still has that awful wound, refused to wear his hat because he wants to show respect to his friend. As he, as he, as he said, Sherman would have done the same for me. Do you know what happened? He got sick, pneumonia, and passed away two weeks ago. A little bit kind of like Harrison. Remember William Henry Harrison? And Davis would be captured in Georgia. He was trying to flee, and he put on a cloak to hide. And so when they caught him, of course, in the north, they presented him as Elvis. Wow, I didn't turn left. They present him as a chorus, dressed as a woman, as we all know is a major insult, correct? <laughs> yeah, obviously very sexist. They accused Lincoln of doing the same thing to sneak into Washington in 1861. One more thing really quickly. Andersonville Prison would be one of the new prisons built in 1864. Grant ended prisoner exchange. No more. He didn't want southern prisoners taken by the north going back and fighting. So that meant that the South had to keep northern prisoners. POW camps on both sides were hell holes. But for a combination of a lot of reasons, mostly a lack of supplies, Confederate prisons were worse. Andersonville prison was a nightmare. No supplies, no sanitation. Thousands of men nearly starved to death. When Union forces liberated this prison, they could not believe what they saw. The commander was a man an officer who was wounded, so a wounded officer, Confederate officer named Harry, or Henry Wirtz. There's Wirtz right there. And Wirtz would be executed by the United States for war crimes. Essentially crimes against humanity. One of the few two, one the only one, the only one to be executed for Andersonville prison. Now I gotta be clear about it. the Union prisoners or prisons weren't a heck of a lot better, but Andersonville was horrific. Wirtz would be arrested because he was in command and only way to describe it was just absolute negligence, what they did, and, and total incompetence. Here he is being executed right there. Davis would be captured. They didn't know what to do with Davis. They ended up, hold, they ended up holding Davis prisoner for two years in perpetual light. They kept a coal lantern or coal lamp burning the whole time he was there. And then they just released him. Davis was hated in the South probably more than he was hated in the North. They blamed him for losing the war. But about 20 years afterwards, his reputation would be rehabilitated. And he's going to be one of the heroes of what we call the Lost Cause. The Southern view that's going to help happen after the war that they were fighting a noble cause. And to give you an idea, that's the total number of men who died. That's the total casualties. Over 620,000 men died for sure. Recent scholarship says that over 800,000 men. 40% of the state budget of the state of Mississippi in 1867 
for artificial lens. Reconstruction on Monday and Tuesday. Sound good? I will see you next week. You know what I'd like all of you to do? Have a great weekend. I know weekends are tough, but soon Monday will be here and you'll be back. So exciting. You excited? Okay, limbo. If you can limbo under that, you don't have to get past. I know we're not limboing. I'm hungry. I didn't eat enough for my friend. I said that if you were being serious. <laughs> I don't know if you can do it. Air probably does that. You can limbo under that. Yeah. Not really. Next is watching the live stream. What's that? Next is watching the live stream. Oh, that's funny. So, yeah.